Thanks for tuning in to Ag PhD. I'm Brian Hefty. And I'm Darren Hefty. Thanks for joining us today. When it comes to base saturation, we talk about potassium a lot. Today we're going to focus on another nutrient that you need a lot more of than potassium. It's calcium. We'll talk about what you should be shooting for on your soil test. Well, it's that time of year when nitrogen is going to get applied in a lot of the United States. We want to talk today about how do you get the best response out of the nitrogen you apply in the fall without losing it before spring. Well, speaking about fall, another thing that you'll still be watching for on your farm is our Weed of the Week. We'll show you how to get it under control. But first, here's our Farm Basics. These days, it can be hard to make the math work in your soybean fields. With the Liberty Link system with Liberty Herbicide, it gets easier. A two plus bushel per acre advantage over Asgrow Roundup Ready to Extend soybeans means 18 plus dollars an acre more for you. Include lower system input costs and more complete weed control, and it all adds up to 33 plus dollars more per acre for your farm. That's smart math. Grow smart with BASF. During our Farm Basics time today, we're going to talk a little about fall weed control in lawns. When you think about stopping dandelions and some of these tough weeds, clovers, why would you not take a shot at them in the fall? And here's one of the opportunities that you've got in the fall that you don't have other times of the year. Most of the other vegetation around you is given up for the year. So your flowers are done, your trees are dropping leaves. It's a great time where you don't have to worry quite as much about off-target movement or any sensitive plants around you. We just have a lot of people that think, well, it's fall, and so I'm not that worried about it. Pretty soon the weeds are going to be dead anyway. We're going into winter. Don't look at it that way. You've got perennials out there. You might have biennials. Even with the annuals, you have to make sure they don't go to seed. So we do find that fall is a pretty good time to spray. Well, here's the other thing, cool season grasses. If you've got Kentucky bluegrass or other cool season grasses in your lawn mix, this is an ideal time. You stop the weeds, the cool season grasses really fill in and choke anything else out. It's a great opportunity for you going into next spring to start clean with a beautiful weed-free lawn. When it comes to weed control, I'm first thinking about broadleaves since we're in a grass. Broadleaves can be tough, but I like Freelix. Freelix is the new 2,4-D. It's got very low volatility. It's dramatically different than the old 2,4-Ds. Just make sure you're using a good strong rate in the fall. Many of the grass weeds that we're fighting in lawns uh, would be spring annual weeds like foxtails and summer annual weeds like crabgrass. Well, they're going to go to seed, and if we can stop them from going to seed, we'll take another shot at them next spring. With perennial grasses like quack grass, really there's never a great time of year to try and kill quack grass. You're going to have to do something pretty substantial to stop it. Oftentimes, people are going to use Roundup and yep. just spray that little patch and then reseed the lawn in those areas. Yep. Otherwise, in terms of a residual product, you could get some pendimethalin out there. Uh, you don't have a tremendous amount of residual choices when it comes to grass control, but I do like pendimethalin. I also like drive for some of those annual grasses. Uh, so generally speaking, we're not doing a lot with the grasses in the fall. We're usually sticking to the broad leaves, but you certainly could focus on grasses if you wanted to. Well, going into this fall, it's a great time to control weeds in your lawn so you can start clean, weed-free next spring. Well, one of the weeds you just might see out in your lawn is our Weed of the Week. Can you identify this week's weed? Take a look inside any rotary combine and you'll find single rotor technology. Technology Case IH introduced over 35 years ago with the Axial Flow Combine. But unless it gives you more bells and whistles with fewer belts and chains, more power using less fuel, it's not an Axial Flow. Because while the heart of every rotary combine beats red, only Case IH gives you the power to do more. Commodity Classic is a great place to recharge your batteries, to reconnect with why you started farming in the first place, and why you can't imagine doing anything else. You'll be among thousands of farmers who share your thirst for knowledge and your passion for agriculture. Commodity Classic is a positive, uplifting, and inspiring environment, one that will keep you fired up when you head back home. Thursday, February 28th through Saturday, March 2nd in sunny Orlando, Florida. Visit CommodityClassic.com.
Leading the charge in strip tillage for more than a decade, the Soil Warrior brings the future to your farm today. Avoid dry run failures with the new High Pro Force Field Pump. Providing the ultimate protection, this wet seal pump will save you on costly in season downtime to keep your sprayer running. Now, all you have to worry about is the weather. High Pro, helping you spray better. No two seasons are the same. Each brings its own set of challenges. And you've seen a few. So many threats and not one single thing can be taken for granted. In the fight against the unpredictable, the Acceleron portfolio provides coverage on four fronts, fungicides, insecticides, nematicides, and bioenhancers. Rise stronger with one simple decision. At Estes Performance Concaves, we know how valuable your time is at harvest. That's why we designed the new XPR Concave System. The XPR System is the number one performance concave system on the market surpassing the rest in both speed and efficiency, ensuring every last grain from your field gets into your tank. Plus, XPR concaves work for all row crops. No more changing concaves, meaning you have less downtime. Take back your bushels this harvest. Get Estes Performance Concaves in your combine today. One of the things that you want to look for on your soil test this fall is your base saturation test. Specifically today, we're going to talk about the nutrient calcium. Usually we say 65 to 80% calcium, but Darren and I are debating a little bit on the top end. We do know on the bottom end, we want to be at least 65% calcium. Here's one of the big reasons why. With calcium, it's a large molecule. You've got to have a lot of that in your soil so you have good porosity. Magnesium is the other one that is very predominant in most soils. Well, magnesium is very, very small. If you have a whole bunch of these little small molecules there, there isn't enough air space, there isn't the pore space, you're going to find you have poor drainage, you have compaction issues, you just don't have good root growth, you don't have a healthy soil because there's not enough oxygen in there, and that's really going to hurt your yields. Now this is more of a long-term play than anything. It's not like, oh, if I get my calcium and magnesium in the right balance, next year my yields are going to double. No, probably not going to happen. But over time, you're going to find that the soil's a lot healthier and everything is going to get substantially better over a few years. Brian mentioned that he and I are kind of debating about exactly where we want to be with our calcium base saturation percentage. The important thing to remember is base saturation has five nutrients in it, and when you add up those percentages, it's going to add up to 100. So if you say, well, if calcium's so good, Brian's just got me convinced I got to have more calcium out there. Well, you don't want to get up to 90% calcium because now you have only 10% left for all these other four nutrients. Well, that's not enough. So when we're talking about base saturation, it's always in a range. We want to see a range. Maybe it's 65% to 75%. Maybe it could be a little bit stronger on calcium too, but you have to leave room for the other nutrients as well. The other thing we haven't really focused on is why is calcium even important in the plant? Well, look, it serves a lot of different functions in the plant, but today I really wanted to focus on, well, how am I going to increase my level in the soil if let's say I'm only at 50%? I guess the first thing that I'm going to look at is why am I only at 50%? Am I there because my magnesium is ridiculously high or am I there because my hydrogen is ridiculously high? It's usually one or the other. If your hydrogen is way high, that means you have a very acid soil and lime is going to correct that. So just make sure you're getting the right lime recommendation to raise pH. If your magnesium is really high, then you probably want to start with a little bit of lime and then add some gypsum. So it all depends on where your other nutrients are at in terms of what source of calcium I'm going to get. Now, when you're looking at calcium sources, the finer the particle size, the quicker you're going to get an impact out of that calcium. So if you've got a low pH, find a lime source with very fine particles. You're going to move the needle quickly and get that calcium into your plants as well. The next question is, what if you have too much calcium? Let's say you're at 90% calcium. That's too much. We know that because I really want my potassium in the 4 to 8% range. I probably want my magnesium at least 12%. Plus, I really want the soil pH less than 7 in the range of 6.3 to 6.8, so my hydrogen needs to be 2 to 10%. So what I'm trying to say is at the very, very most, we want calcium at 80%. So if your calcium's at 90, this isn't going to be a quick fix or anything like that, but over time, we've got to look at how do I get more of those other nutrients out in that soil. 
I'm going to focus on things like, hey, I just need more potassium, I'll put that out. If I need more magnesium, I'll put some of that out. And if I want to try to drop my pH down, I have to make sure my drainage is fixed first, and then I'm going to look at elemental sulfur. Well, this is an interesting discussion today because you're probably thinking, well, I'm looking at my soils and I wasn't even thinking about putting calcium out there. I was thinking about N, P, and K. Maybe I was thinking about sulfur or a micronutrient. We just want you to start at the top. Calcium, when you look at your soil test in parts per million, chances are it's going to be the highest number that you see on the page, and it probably should be. Calcium is really important for getting all the other nutrients into our crop. We've got to start here and manage that calcium. We look at the base saturation test to help us with what the balance of calcium is in our soil, and we suggest that you look at it as well. Well, whether you have high calcium or low calcium, you can still have our Weed of the Week. We'll tell you how to stop it on your farm coming up later in the show. Introducing the SoilMax ZD48, the newest addition to the SoilMax Gold Digger lineup. The first plow designed for smaller class tractors, the ZD48 has been tested on tractors weighing between 10,000 and 16,000 pounds with excellent results. Designed for row crop farms, vineyards, irrigation, and specialty crop farms. The SoilMax ZD48 will install tile up to 48 inches deep as well as install 3 or 4 inch tile. The ZD48 truly opens up the world of tile installation to more farms than ever before. These days, it can be hard to make the math work in your soybean fields. With the Liberty Link system with Liberty Herbicide, it gets easier. A 2 plus bushel per acre advantage over Asgro Roundup Ready to Extend soybeans means 18 plus dollars an acre more for you. Include lower system input costs and more complete weed control, and it all adds up to 33 plus dollars more per acre for your farm. That's smart math. Grow smart with BASF. If you're looking to expand your farm's grain handling, you want everything to be fast and efficient. The Quick Belt from Norwood Sales is your all-around grain handling solution. Our conveyor-based system uses an 18-inch belt in a 10-inch tube, which minimizes seed damage while moving more than 10,000 bushels an hour. That's fast enough to fill a semi in six minutes. Plus, our hood is designed to gently direct the flow of grain straight down, keeping your crop in condition. Keep your grain and your farm moving with the Quick Belt from Norwood Sales. Let's take a look at our picks for the championship season. We've got 10-34-0. No, no, no. I don't want to talk about them. I want to talk about this Agro Liquid team. Take a look at this lineup. They got it all. The talent, their players can meet any challenge on any field. The coaching staff, the best I've seen. So that's your pick? No discussions? Nope. Agro Liquid is the team. They're going all the way to the championship. <laughs> Are you looking for an easy way to apply dry powdered products to your stored grain? Do you want to use the applicator recommended by industry leaders for products like Diacon D and other dry powder products? Changing Time CT applicators successfully apply a diversity of products quickly, easily, and accurately. The innovative CT applicators are designed to give you the most accurate application of products such as talc, inoculants, fertilizers, and other dry products. For commercial use or on the farm, you need the applicator industry leaders are using. CT applicators for the changing times. Today we're going to talk a little about fall nitrogen. The very first thing that we always want to take a look at whenever we start thinking, hey, I'm going to apply my nitrogen like six months before I actually need it. The first question is, can my soil hold that? That's a great question, Brian, and the honest answer is nobody knows. Now you may say, well, hold on, I got a heavy soil and we normally don't get much rainfall here. That's exactly what we say on our farm. Heavy soil, not much rainfall. Once you put that nitrogen out there though, who's in control? Nobody, the weather is. You could get just tons of rain all of a sudden. We got seven to eight inches of rain this fall when we started harvest on our farm. Well, we weren't expecting that. You may say, well, an inch or two, but seven or eight? What if you had nitrogen out there already? You certainly would have lost some. 
So you definitely have to think about this. The, the more time there is between when your plants are going to need that nitrogen and when you put it out there, you gotta be very cautious, no matter what soil type you've got. So here are the other factors that you wanna look at if you say, well, I really wanna put some fall nitrogen out. To begin with, look at cation exchange capacity. 10 times your CEC will give you a rough idea on how much nitrogen your soil can hold. So let's say you got a cation exchange capacity of 20, like we do on a bunch of our ground. It'll hold about 200 pounds. I'm gonna be safe though. I'm probably only putting out 120 to 150 pounds. Next, I gotta look at, well, what ground is most likely to get the water? In other words, I'm worried about flooding. There's no possible chance my river bottom ground is ever getting fall nitrogen, no way, no how. And then the third thing I look at is the amount of time outside of the frost that this nitrogen is going to be there. In other words, I don't want to be too early in the fall. I want to get close to when my ground freezes up. And then in the spring, I've got to make sure that this is going to be ground that I'm going to plant right away in the spring as the frost is coming out of the ground. If my ground is frozen, my nitrogen really isn't going anywhere. Now, what form of nitrogen are we going to use? We get questions all the time on Ag PhD Radio. Hey, what about fall anhydrous versus fall urea versus what if I use 28% liquid? That would be really convenient for me to use. What are the differences with different forms of N? Yeah, well, the number one thing is it's fall anhydrous, and that's really it. It's all we think about in our area. Because that anhydrous, it's going to turn to ammonium in the soil. It's going to lock in place. Remember, ammonium is positively charged. Your soil is negatively charged. So that's really what we want to do. If you want to put urea on, you want to put 28% on. I mean, other than just a few pounds. You want to put 20 pounds out, who cares? But if we're talking a decent amount of pounds, with nitrogen, you got to wait until spring if it's urea or 28%. Well, the other form of nitrogen that's getting to be more popular has been ammonium sulfate. And you think, well, hey, it has ammonium yep. as the form of nitrogen. Yep. The problem is it's tagged on with sulfate, which could be an issue in terms of leaching away some of that sulfur. Yeah, but I'm not too worried about it. Again, most people are only putting 100, 200, 300 pounds out. You're not getting that many total pounds of either nitrogen or sulfur. No real big deal. Not too concerned about that. The other thing that I would say is if you're going to apply any nitrogen in the fall, I'm looking at anhydrous together with NSERV. Well, Brian said to put on this nitrogen later rather than earlier, and I totally agree with that. But the question is, what is later? Now, if you're in Canada, for example, late may already have passed. If you're catching some snow and some freezing soil temps, well, it's too late to get anything done. So you don't want to wait that long, but you also don't want to be out there too early and have nitrogen loss. Yeah, so generally speaking, people will say, hey, wait until the soil temp is at 50 degrees. I don't really buy that because what we find is that soil temps can drop very, very quickly. So what I'm looking at in terms of how late or how early I'm going to apply this nitrogen in the fall is really the calendar. What I'm saying here is a lot of people will tell you, oh, wait until the soil temp's below 50 degrees. Well, we could have a really cold early stretch in the fall and we could hit 50 degree soil temps, but I know based on the calendar, um, chances are that's not going to last or I'm still a long ways until freeze up. So I usually want to get this done on my farm sometime in very late October or early November. Again, I'm just really looking at the calendar. Now, one other thing that I wanted to mention here, we've talked about these different forms of nitrogen, but what we haven't mentioned yet is what are we going to do with manure? Well, with manure, there's certainly a lot more in it than just nitrogen, but there are leachable things like nitrogen that are out there, so we've got to be very cautious when we're applying the manure. Again, we'd prefer to do it as late as we can. We'd also prefer to get that tilled underneath the soil or injected rather than just left on top, not just due to the odor, but due to nutrient loss. We don't want to have loss of those nutrients just up into the air. We want to get them down into the soil where they can help our crops. There are nitrogen stabilizers for manure that can and really should be used in a lot of cases as well. And just make sure you're not over applying the manure. You've got to look at manure as a nitrogen source rather than just, hey, this is a waste product I got to get rid of and I got to throw it out. I only have so many acres. No, you've really got to look at how many acres do I actually have to get my manure out over and am I over applying my nitrogen? Just be cautious. First, always look at your cation exchange capacity, multiply that times 10 and never exceed that amount. When it comes to fall nitrogen, there are a lot of things to keep in mind, the time of the year, how much you can apply and so forth. Just pay attention on your farm this year. We really can't afford to lose any money, but we also don't wanna have a negative environmental impact either with fall nitrogen. 
And one other thing you might be out trying to take care of in your fields this fall is our Weed of the Week. We'll show you how to stop it coming up next. The Weed of the Week is brought to you by Corteva AgriScience, Agriculture Division of Dow DuPont. Finish the fight against tough weeds with the Enlist Weed Control System. Weeds are tough, but we're tougher with unrivaled weed control, reduced drift, and near zero volatility. So, who's tough now? <laughs> Our weed of the week is dog fennel, and I'm gonna get more specific here. It's mayweed chamomile. You know, we were we were having a little discussion about this before the show. There are different types of dog fennel well, there, around the world. There are the several world. different dog fennels out there. <laughs> what we're talking about here is an annual weed. Oftentimes it's gonna germinate in the fall, but it can germinate in the spring as well. It's gonna get maybe up to two feet tall, so it's a, a fairly small weed. It doesn't seem like that's gonna be a big problem, Brian. Where I first started seeing a big problem with mayweed weed chamomile though was out in the Pacific Northwest. A lot of those continuous wheat farmers were having issues with this and really what it kind of came back to is the ALS herbicides were not controlling the weed. Well they anymore. were awesome on it. They were great and we had all these ALS products were that did great. a really nice job. The problem is that was the only mode of action that was really working and so when we used it over and over again pretty soon it ran out of gas. So now what are we left with and what other products can control mayweed chamomile or dog fennel. Okay, well when I think about wheat, the one I'm gonna pick is Sharpen. It's fantastic on most broadleaf weeds. So you start with Sharpen, but it's gotta be used pre-emerge and unfortunately it's gonna cost some money. Two ounces is roughly around 10 bucks. Then post-emerge, Buctrel's okay, Husky, because it's got some Buctrel and HPPD in there, that's okay. We don't have a lot of fantastic options post. Well, and many times people will fall back to, well, what about dicamba or 2,4-D? This yep. is one of those weeds that 2,4-D is actually a little bit better than dicamba on. I would still say Buctrel or preferably Husky would be the ideal choice for me, but crop rotation limits that with Husky, so you've got to pay attention. Buctrel doesn't have any soil residual, so that's one that you can rotate to about anything from. Uh, otherwise, yes, you could put some 2,4-D in to try and help out some other weed killer, but in my mind, that's just a little too hard on crops. I like to use it in non-crop areas or, or uh, grasslands, those kinds of things. Okay, so if I look at corn, not too worried about this weed, I'll start with verdict, follow up with status. In soybeans, I'm going to use the three pre's, follow post-emerge, quite frankly, with Roundup, Liberty, uh, Dicamba. I mean, many different products will get this under control. Well, that's all time we have for our Weed of the Week, May Weed Chamomile or Dog Fennel. But stay tuned, Iron Talk is coming up next. Morton is eager to make the building you've always dreamed of a reality. Visit us online at mortonbuildings.com. Out here, great yield starts with great weed control. That's why I choose the Roundup Ready Extend crop system, the system that makes the difference. Because only I know what it takes out here. Yields what it's all for. But keeping my fields clean all season, that's what it's all about. This is my field. Farmers across the country have put their confidence in the Roundup Ready Extend crop system. These are their experiences. I'm excited about using Extendo Max to clean up some of our fields. We've had pressure from our neighbors with the water hemp, and the Extend Max has just cleaned it up. The Extendo Max is going to get the pig weeds and any other weeds that are out there. I am extremely satisfied with this product. Seems to work pretty dang good. 
Your planter is the single most important piece of equipment on your farm, because without a uniform stand, you can't reach maximum yield. That's why Harvest International set out to design a planter that takes advantage of the newest innovations in planter technology. Built tough for high speed and integrated with the latest precision enhancements, Harvest International planters ensure every seed you plant today puts more in your bin at harvest. Harvest International, planting the future. We're live on the red carpet, waiting for the next generation Creden soybean. There he is. Oh, Ed, look, it's Creden's Liberty Link GT27. I know, Adna. He's got elite genetics. You gotta love his four bushel per acre yield advantage. And he's both Liberty and glyphosate herbicide tolerant. Definitely the year's hottest performer. Ask your Credenz retailer about the new Credenz Liberty Link GT27 soybeans. Grow smart with BASF. Always read and follow label directions. And how about the big man, Pro Germinator? Yeah, this guy's got some experience in the field. But look at his stats. You can't argue with those kind of results. You're right. I know a lot of teams wishing their phosphorus player had those kind of numbers. Right, but this guy's not just phosphorus. He's got the nitrogen, the potassium, the micros. All those just add up to his phosphorus game. And his game is good. Iron Talk is brought to you by Case IH. Take a look inside any rotary combine and you'll find single rotor technology. Technology Case IH introduced over 35 years ago with the Axial Flow Combine. But unless it gives you more bells and whistles with fewer belts and chains, more power using less fuel, it's not an Axial Flow. Because while the heart of every rotary combine beats red, only Case IH gives you the power to do more. On-farm storage is important for grain, for seed, and also for fertilizer. Today's Iron Talk will focus on one specific tool in fertilizer storage, liquid tanks. If you handle any amount of liquid fertilizer at planting time, side dress time, or at any point during the growing season, you've learned two things. First, everyone else wants product about the same exact time that you do, and it's often tough to get what you want exactly when you want it. Second, dealers load up on product in the off-season because they buy it cheaper, yet they charge you a higher price per gallon in season. Here are a few ideas of how you may equip your farm to lower your fertilizer costs and reduce the hassle of getting your fertilizer when you need it. When it comes to fertilizer tanks, getting a strong, sturdy tank should go without saying. Next, have separate tanks for each product so you can store them without worrying about settling out and also you have the flexibility to change your blend next spring. Then, be sure you have adequate capacity. Have enough tanks so you can handle a full load plus some room to go. Ideally, you'd have enough storage so you can go at least two or three days while you're waiting for the next load to come. Whenever you fill tanks, choose products that work well in the conditions you have to store them in. For example, liquid 28% nitrogen doesn't freeze, but many starter blends do. Now, if you don't have heated storage, you likely should wait until spring to take your starter. Also, if your storage area isn't heated, Inside storage is strongly preferred over outside storage. The weather conditions just don't change as much or as quickly when the tanks are inside. Finally, if your tanks happen to be outside, and really even if they're inside, chemical and UV resistance prevents algae growth in the tanks and prevents chemical degradation of the fertilizer by tank-borne contaminants like rust. A proper liquid fertilizer handling system can save you time and money on your farm. That's all for today's Iron Talk, and now back to the show. That's all the time we have for today's show, but before we go, we want to invite you to tune in to the Ag PhD radio show. You'll find us each weekday on Sirius XM channel 147 at 2 p.m. Central. And don't miss the next Ag PhD TV show. We'll have another Weed of the Week, Farm Basics, Iron Talk, and a whole lot more. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for watching Ag PhD.